For our scripture reading, let's look to Philippians chapter 3 together. Philippians chapter 3. We know from the account in the book of Acts how it was this congregation was raised up. First with a meeting of Lydia there by the river where God opened her heart. And then through the Philippian jailer when Paul was put into prison for preaching the gospel. Be guarded by that Philippian jailer. Did he know that God had purposed that one of his servants should speak of Christ to him and his household? And that's how the church was raised up there in Philippi. So this congregation, very tender to Paul, knowing their history together. And so he's writing back to them in the face of his own afflictions being in prison himself again there in Rome, but also in light of what they were facing there. It speaks with very much kindness and tenderness about them, but also warning. That's what we have here. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, even through the conflicts, knowing that God's hand ordains all things. People say all the time, well, he's in control. Well, he he directs and ordains every detail. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. You hear somewhat of the fatherly aspect here of Paul, concern for these children. I mean, must have raised children, you know, like when you begin to go over again, what's important? Like, oh, dad, come on. But he says to these, to write the same things to you, particularly as pertains to their souls and the glory of God, to me indeed is not grievous. And for you, it is safe. Herein is your safety in who God is and what Christ has done on your behalf. So he says, beware of dogs. Such was the burden that the Lord had given Paul concerning some of these Judaizers that were coming in behind him and nipping at his heels. And here the word dogs is literally wild dogs. So we're not just talking about little puppies. We're talking about people that are so against the spirit of Antichrist, against any message that gives Christ all the glory, that they would devour like wild dogs. He says, beware of evil workers. These were people in the outward seemed religious, and yet they're evil workers. Why? Because they were preaching another righteousness other than that which Christ earned and established. And they were adding to, saying, there's something you must do. And here, the particular thing was circumcision. And notice how God caused Paul to use this language, beware of the concision. That word literally means the mutilation. These were people that were saying that they had to be circumcised in order to be saved. In addition to whatever Christ had accomplished, they would say, well, we're not leaving Christ out. We're just saying that you have to have this ceremony. And so he very expressly states there in verse 3, for we are the circumcision. He's talking about what it is to be a true son of Israel, a child of Israel, Christ being God's Israel. The word Israel means prince with God. They equated to who they were with their traditions and earthly history. But he says, we are the circumcision. And notice who, who is the circumcision? Who is the true? Who are those that the flesh has been cut away, spiritually speaking? When Christ died, he put away all that pertains to this flesh. And he says, which worship God in the spirit. And there again, I don't know why the editors put that in small s, but it's worshiping God in the spirit of God, capital S. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. It's like in physical circumcision. You take that flesh and cut it away and you cast it away. All that's been done in Christ. He says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. So now he's reasoning with human reasoning. 
Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee. He's recounting how he was raised. In essence, saying, I know what I'm dealing with here because I was once of your number. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Again, the word church means the called out ones. God was calling out by his spirit those for whom Christ had paid the debt, and he was there persecuting them. Touching the righteousness which is in the law of blameless. And when he's saying that, he's speaking from his own perspective. He really considered himself to be upright and righteous in keeping the law. But, there's that three letter word, but what things were gained to me at that particular time in my blindness, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things. So you got in verse 7, I counted at that time when the Lord opened my eyes, and I continue to count not just some things, but all things, but loss. He's talking there about the law and our efforts to keep it, and all those things that he thought he was doing such a good job before Christ was revealed to him. But I count them as loss for what? The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He's talking there about that revelation of Christ, whereby now he saw how Christ was the fulfillment of all that was written in the Old Testament. And types and pictures and prophecy and promise. Boy, what a view when the Lord opens the heart to see Christ throughout all Scripture. And he says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He's talking about relationships and acquaintances. Completely isolated out because of the revelation of Christ. But he says... I do count them but dung, manure, that I may win Christ. Better to have Christ than what I thought I had back there. Of course, he was Christ all along. In God's election and in the redemption, he was there. Likely would have seen Christ crucified because he was of that Sanhedrin, that number that ordered Christ's death. But now that I may win Christ, this very one that previously I denounced and condemned, now to win and be found in him. This is what it is to win Christ. It's not something that you earn in, in order to get him to come to you, no. But being who he is and having had his eye on him well before he even knew him and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, or my personal obedience to the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Notice it doesn't say through faith in Christ, but the faith of Christ. Where you see that word faith, that's God's revelation in the gospel concerning Christ and concerning his death that he accomplished. That's where this righteousness of God was established, and he calls it that, the righteousness which is God by faith, by that revelation of Christ. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Here he's talking about the power of that resurrection of Christ, whereby when he had finished paying the debt and ascended up into glory, that resurrection was the testimony of God having accepted that sacrifice. So that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. In that statement, you've got Christ and him crucified. To know him, but the power of his resurrection has to do with what he accomplished by his death. God accepted and approved that righteousness and imputed it once for all to the account, the spiritual account of everyone for whom he paid the debt. And now he says the fellowship of his sufferings. When he's talking about that, he's talking about what Christ suffered to obtain, he has obtained. How does he get it? Well, there's not going to be one for whom he paid the debt. That's that fellowship of Christ's sufferings. He's not pointing out his own here, but Christ's sufferings being made conformable unto his death. When Christ died, when it says conformable, that's where the reconciliation took place. Everything that stood against him as a sinner, Christ put away. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. There he's talking about in the final day when Christ calls 
unto himself, everyone for whom he paid the debt. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect in himself. See, perfection is in the righteousness of God in Christ. But in ourselves, we're still as much sinners as we ever were. But he said, I follow after. That's an interesting word also, to pursue after. That's the spirit of God. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehend of Christ Jesus. It continues to give the glory to Christ and what he accomplished without presumption. He's, he's saying no part of what I do is going to add to what Christ has already done. I follow after. He's the shepherd. We're the sheep. My sheep hear my voice. They seek him. They follow after him. And not that he himself counts himself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, notice, forgetting those things which are behind. I mean, people read that and think, well, those are the bad things. We put them behind it. He's talking about whatever things he thought were good. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. That is the glory of God in Christ, his grace that's in Christ alone. He said, I press toward the mark like a runner for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Such is the work of grace and spirit in the heart. It gives us that desire to follow after him. And he says, let us therefore as many as be perfect. Now there it's talking about, that word perfect means mature. You begin as a child, your eyes open to see the glory of Christ and you continue to grow, you mature in that grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But be thus minded, be of one mind. Don't let these others distract you or turn you away or make you feel guilty or think that there's something more. Be thus minded, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. It just shows that we're not all brought in as robots and everybody in marching in a lot step. In a congregation, it's like a family. There's some that are newly converted by the Spirit of God, others young in the Lord, continue to grow, and then you've got the more mature. It's a family. But notice it's according to as God is pleased to reveal to each one of his own. You don't expect a young child to be talking and speaking and acting like an adult. There's, there's going to be a learning, and this is what he's talking about here. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. In other words, it's like a moving caravan. You can only move along as quickly as the weakest sheep. But the Lord never leaves one behind, nor do we. Walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. What's the same rule? It's Christ. He's our rule and his grace, God's grace in him. Let us mind the same thing. Let our minds, by God's grace, be on Christ alone. And brethren, be followers together of me, even as he was following Christ, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. When he's talking about himself, he's not turning your eyes to him, but this testimony he just gave of how it is that God caused him to win Christ. So walk in that way. And he warns them again, verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. What was the issue? That they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. When a man declares or believes about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's not talking about the wood of the cross, but who died, and why he died, and what he accomplished, and where he is now. There are those that feign being the Lord's, and yet, when you get right down to it, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. They are those that say, no, it wasn't all accomplished at the cross. There's something more that you need to make it effectual. I've run into that in so-called great circles. They follow that old Reformed Calvinistic teaching that it's when you believe that you're justified. That's not what the scriptures say, but that's what they are. And they'll say, well, God gives the belief, but 
you're still under his wrath until you believe. That's what they teach. Well, if that's the case, then Christ's work accomplished nothing. When Christ said it is finished, it's finished. And they'll get upset at you, but here Paul describes such as those that are enemies of the cross. If you can move any part of our redemption, our justification, our sanctification off of the cross in some way delayed on and put on man, you are acting as an enemy of the cross. And it says here, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who's seeking their own glory and honor, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly or fleshly things. You insert any act of man or will of man or work of man into this in addition to what Christ accomplished, that's to your shame. For our conversation is in heaven. He's being of Christ. Where is Christ now? Seated in the heavens. For whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who can change our vile body. We're still vile. And it's only the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that's our redemption, it's our salvation. That in that day, when this is all said and done, it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able, even to subdue all things unto himself. I can't fathom what it would be like to worship Christ one day without this flesh. The encumbrance of the flesh and the sin. The curse of sin has been put away, but we still with the presence of sin. But oh, that in that day, Christ comes to receive his own unto himself. There will be no sin. We should be like we will see him as he is. Gracious Father, thank you for this word, how we need it. I pray that by your grace we would heed the warnings to know just how all around us, and even within us, is that flesh cause our eyes to be turned from Christ. We desire, dear Lord, that you're pleased to bless us today. Have him have all the glory and honor and praise in all things. Even in our worship, I pray that you grant us your spirit and worship you through him in spirit and truth. We give you the praise and honor and glory of your Savior's name.